be here, especially at the beautiful University of San Diego campus. I mean, when I first drove up here and I looked around, I was like, wow, I had no idea it was so beautiful, and then immediately added it to my um, short list of schools that I would like to I'm sure you guys will be very glad about. As a junior, I guess I really do need to start looking at schools more seriously. I will have to begin touring and stuff, but for right now, it's definitely been an amazing journey of learning and teaching. And I think that one of the most amazing things I realized over the course of my journey, speaking at conferences, getting to meet some exceptional teachers and students, is that even though people might say, like, you're special, you're an exception, or a prodigy, or any of these words, I find it extremely true that what each and every one of you, what ordinary students and teachers have to say is absolutely valuable and, in fact, crucial to learning that I've done. It's only when you know how to learn that you really know how to teach. And so I look forward to receiving some of the best new ideas, um, maybe for a future presentation from some of you in this room. Now, I titled my presentation, The New Kids on the Block, Youth Digital Culture and Student Voice in Education, because I was really interested in exploring with you the idea of these new innovative things that we can play and how we can look at them as collaborators and not competitors. But I also wanted to tell you a story about something that happened just recently. So my mom and I, we flew here, we arrived, and as we were walking to our hotel room, I commented to her, you know, I really belong at home with the campaign. I trust my team, but, you know, it's in the hands of the voters now, and I feel a little nervous. Yeah. <laughs> you can take a look at my opening statement as a candidate here. I'm asking for your vote for the first congressional district in Washington State. The famous poet makes confused one of my favorites, but it's not a So it's a pretty high-stress moment for us. Now you might be listening to this and thinking, 
hey, this is one project in one government class, and the voters are a bunch of your high school classmates. Take a chill pill, bro. <laughs> but you see the energy and the enthusiasm around this one project, I feel evidence something a little bit larger. It isn't just the story of one girl who gets really, really excited by the chance to be a politician. This isn't just the story of an amazing team who is extremely dedicated to getting the candidate elected and determined to win on the issues that we believe in. This is a story of great teaching that inspires passion and engagement. In the 21st century classroom, I think that passion and engagement are more important than ever. In traditional education, you see knowledge and information being transferred in the same way time after time. Sure, maybe the blackboards have been replaced with whiteboards, but as I said in the opening <coughs> statement, you walk into a classroom, you still see students stuck in what is largely a 19th century model of education, sitting in their neat little rows, looking up at the teacher as their primary source of knowledge. And that has changed very little from earlier days of public education in America, even as America and the world has changed around us. The internet has democratized access to knowledge to an unprecedented extent. All of you know this in your personal and in your work lives, you may have seen this, as you are fairly able to access things that you might have had to go to a library, um, go to certain experts to get before. Now, what does this mean for educators and administrators? Is this scary, or is this a call for celebration? It might seem obvious, but I've seen reactions that definitely show both sides of that question. And the more important one, perhaps, is how should educational leaders recognize where the changes are and the implications that that has for implementing technology in education? What is the teacher's new role in the classroom when the students are no longer looking up to him or her as the only source of information? I think it's easy to think of these new kids on the block, the myriad sources that we have available for information and for content creation as competitors instead of collaborators. And I'll admit, I've seen why firsthand. In my school, we have a one-to-one -one netbook program. And more often than not, I will look around the room and see at least one person, usually more, on their computer, sometimes legitimately taking notes, sometimes playing a multiplayer shooter game with other <laughs> classmates. <laughs> the thing it is, that might surprise you or not, you know a lot of different students, but this happens just as much in my AP classes. In fact, my straight A friends are the ones who get away with doing this sometimes. <laughs> now, when you have this device, it seems to hold an entire world of entertainment, information, and connection. It's easy to see why this could be a competitor to the teacher standing at the front of the room. I'd like to ask the students in the room a question and be honest. Have you ever in class checked your mobile device, your computer, gone on to something non <laughs> Seeing a lot of raised hands here. <laughs> and for the students who didn't raise your hand, either you're way better than I am or you're really good at mine. <laughs> I know I have, I will admit it. I have. When, before our school finally wised up and blocked Tumblr, I was reading about <laughs> the secret lives of, or not so secret lives, of various people and their complaints. That's mostly what Tumblr is. Um, but I think that the important thing to realize is that this, instead of being looked at as something where, oh, we have to shut down the computers, we can't have students looking at screens because it's a competitor, we need to find the silver lining here. If we can change the false dichotomy of technology as either cure-all or evil, we can move toward a smarter vision of the intersection of data, technology, youth, digital culture, and education in the 21st century. Out with the traditional blackboard and assignments, in with projects that have real-world impact, and students using devices for educational purpose. The new kids on the block are everything from the tools we own and master to how our cultural environment changes how we access information, entertainment, and our understanding of the world. Before I delve into the topic, allow me to quickly introduce how I got started in this in the first place with teaching and learning. So to start off as I look at my own educational past, because I think that we can derive a lot of learning from our personal experiences, I'm glad that I didn't go to school for 10 years. Now you might be thinking, wait, she didn't go to school for 10 years, what is this? Well, when I was three years old, oops, those are my campaign posters, this is me as a person. Yeah, I'm really proud of, like, I, I feel like we're, uh, it's really original. It's super, super, you know, I think the Obama team really ripped us off. <laughs> this is me at three years old, decidedly less into 
politics. Actually, not that much. I was uh, following Gore versus Bush. But <laughs> <laughs> I was really, really into reading and writing. This is me. That's my older sister, Adriana. And we just had the greatest time. We would teach each other. I feel like, in thinking about learning, I saw a lot of the things that we worked so hard to create in classrooms, peer-to-peer -peer learning, and students teaching teachers. It really happened organically and naturally. Um, and we didn't really have to try that hard to do that. My sister taught me, and I taught her, and it was one of the, I think it was really beautiful in a way, just looking at, back at it sentimentally now. So what created this environment was that I started learning at home with a group of other kids. They would come for the after-school programs, and my mom would hire teachers, and we would supplement that by taking some classes at my school district's homeschooling resource center. And I did a lot of creative writing at this time since I was very advanced in that field. I got to take classes with kids who were sometimes seven, eight years older than me. And I'm glad that I had that freedom at an early age because I was able to grow and develop at a pace that I would not have been able to do had I been trapped in the confines of bubbles on a worksheet. <laughs> Our teachers, none of them were certified, I'm pretty sure. They were all recent <laughs> college graduates, or some were still in college, as a matter of fact. But they were all incredibly passionate about their subjects. And I think that my mom really cared more about how much passion they had for a topic than whether they were following a strict sequence. I'm glad about that because even though it meant that, sure, maybe I got to some things a little earlier or later than other kids, I got to learn about subjects that some of my classmates and friends won't be able to get to until they're in college. Everything from art history to Mexican revolutionaries to human anatomy. And through our class connection with our tutors, we became as excited about the subjects as they did. The love was really contagious. And it wasn't your ordinary classroom in another way. The fact that it was customized to us as we developed and changed, got better at certain things, needed more improvement in others. My mom had regular conversations with the tutors, and any time my sister and I felt like we weren't being engaged or something was just too hard, and, you know, the teachers didn't understand, we would go straight to mom or we would go straight to them. <laughs> I feel like that was a great way to involve student voice. We wrote a lot every single day. And I feel like today, a lot of my success that has been possible is because of that early, uh, those early roots in writing and learning that was customized to us. Fast forward a few years, and the seemingly perfect little setup started to dissolve um, when we moved from Renton to Redmond. You might know the city as the headquarters of Microsoft, <laughs> and a bliss of Redmond pride in the room. <laughs> and so today I go to regular school. I also take two online classes, which helps me manage my travel schedule a bit. And in this way, I'm experiencing more of a blended learning model. Nevertheless, it's been a bit difficult at times to mesh with my extracurriculars because I have some rather odd extracurriculars, you might say. Although I've spent less hours sitting in schools than many students, I've been to more classrooms than probably most of my peers. I've spoken to over 500 schools and classrooms to date, whether presentations to students or doing professional development sessions, speaking motivationally at assemblies about reading and writing. It really ranges. Um, a lot of different things. So how did I get started from being this regular student who was good at writing to becoming a teacher? Well, my aspirations started in a decidedly old school place with a little house on the prairie. This is my Halloween costume from two years ago, actually. And I wish I, I think it speaks volumes about how much I think I still had that latent desire to be a pioneer. And it was very much declared when I was little. I had this very special place in my seven-year-old heart for a little house on the prairie. Like some of you, maybe I had the entire box to set with the classic Garth Brooks illustrations that had the shrine-like place on my bookshelf. And I wanted to be exactly like Laura Ingalls Wilder. I read about her adventures and misadventures from Wisconsin and North Dakota and how she became a teacher. And she was also this person who was younger than everyone else and having to prove herself to an older crowd. And I really related because I was always younger than everybody else. And when I started teaching, a lot of times my students who I'd be talking to about writing and reading would be taller and older than I was. Now this whole teaching thing, though, was a very strange career choice at seven years of age. Because, and probably a lot of you have seen this firsthand, kids, you might ask them what you want to be when you grow up, and sadly I feel like it's not something that a lot of um, kids or teenagers go to automatically. The idea of teaching being connected to being old is something that's very culturally ingrained as well. The Chinese word for teacher, lao shou, which I have completely butchered because I don't speak Mandarin that well to write it, um, it actually literally means old master. Mm -hmm. And 
now when you take away the old from that, you don't have a teacher anymore, which I feel like is rather unfortunate, considering that I was a young old master. <laughs> so I felt, though, that since I had this passion about reading and writing, that I really wanted to translate it into helping others. And for me, the most expedient way to do that was through teaching. So someone told me once, when I was really young, maybe six, I think, I don't like reading or writing in a nonchalant voice. And I kind of looked at her like, how is this possible? What dark magic is this? <laughs> because up until that point, and you can call it childish naivete, but I just couldn't fathom a world in which people did not like to read and write. So that passion was what started me on my journey to become a teacher. Now what if we could create more moments like this for students? We have to ask ourselves where the next generation of teachers will come from, and getting students deeply involved in subjects that they're passionate about, giving them the chance to help older and younger students. Creating the next generation of teachers doesn't necessarily start as you know talking to a group of undergrad students and saying, think about teaching. It might start with a kid like me who was seven years old. Now, through this unique role as a teacher and student across many mediums, whether online or in person, at a small home school or a large public school, I found that increasingly the diversity of our students and the wealth of information we have at our fingertips necessitates a new school model where learning is customized for each student. In the olden days, you saw customization happen naturally because there's a picture of Aristotle and Alexander the Great. You would have a situation where a teacher would know one person very well and work with them for a long time. And we might not be able to give every student their own Aristotle. I feel like that <laughs> run into a few budget issues. <laughs> I think we should aspire to build a new kind of school that allows every student to become one. That is, being able to question, think deeply, and have an impact. Creating this new school demands an awareness of youth digital culture and its role in our education, actively involving student voice, and meaningfully implementing data in the decision making and teaching. These days, and some of you might have been a little bit fatigued of this, hearing how much the world has changed, it's the 21st century, look at everything that's changed and you know, other variations of that, and I understand that. But it definitely is true that the jobs that we're preparing students for are extremely different from the jobs that maybe you applied for um, when you were applying for your first job, or even some that were around 10 years ago. If you take a look at the list of jobs over at Twitter, and this is a company that didn't even exist when I was born, yet has made more money than I probably ever will in my lifetime, <laughs> you can see that there are the open positions. They have some really interesting ones, um, a lot of things that I don't even know what they mean, but also some things that I would wonder, are students walking to school today being prepared for? Will they have the skills and knowledge necessary to get one of these jobs? There are all these things like software engineer native applications. Are students learning how to code? Are students given the opportunity to learn more about computer science or managing um, any of these different kinds of skills that are required? You see a lot of these things like my SQL DBA. I have no idea what that means. I feel like I should though. Because if these are the kinds of jobs that will be available, that will pay well, that will build the 21st century economy, I think that I would at least want to know it. So yeah, open positions on Twitter, and sadly I'm pretty sure I would not be able to get any of them. <laughs> now, I'm okay with that because personally I'm not super crazy about working on Twitter, but I definitely think that students who walk into school should have the opportunity to understand what those jobs are and how to be prepared for them. Many experts in the corporate world, advertising agencies and companies have realized exactly how important it is to transform their approach to advertising to align with where their customers are, in the other word, online. The traditional one-way print advertising world has been replaced with one that's a lot more varied, that has digital components and social media components. Advertisers are truly reaching customers where they are on the computers. Education, too, can reach us where we, the customers, or the students are online. Some people might say that this approach really denigrates the authority of teachers. The teachers should stay a bit removed from the culture they experience with students. However, to me, the best teachers are the ones who really understand what we're going through as students, who make it a priority to understand youth and our digital activities and social connections on the internet. After all, they also always say, know your audience. When teachers demonstrate their interest and know how to navigate this world that we're so familiar with, they 
gain a lot of reliability and relevance. For many of my generation, the internet can truly be described as a second home. We're on social media constantly, contributing and consuming content, and we can build up careers this way. Um, there's a rapper in Seattle native, Macklemore, some of you might have heard his music, and he's been releasing music since 2000. But I and a lot of my classmates and friends had never heard of him until his latest album, The Heist, really took off and like hit the top of the charts on iTunes, and people started sharing his music like crazy. There was a time when I would go on Facebook and literally I would scroll down and probably out of 10 posts, like six would be one of his songs. I didn't pay too much attention to it at first, but when that happened, I was like, wait, who is this dude? Why have I not heard of him before? And I started like listening to his songs. And I think that my parents are getting annoyed by like how much I've been repeating playlists and stuff. But it is definitely um, hot stuff because of how much people share it, because of how viral it went on social media. And through our own brand of humor, we can teach each other about social issues and lessons beyond the classroom. Youth digital culture provides huge insights about how my generation plays as well as learns. So let's do a quick refresher course. FTW stands for A, feed the world, B, for the win, C, forget the word, or D, finish the word. Raise your hand for A. Okay, raise your hand for B. All right, raise your hand for C, and raise your hand for D. Oh, that was a pretty mixed response. I think a lot of D. Well, if you're doing something FTW, it's for the win. Uh, and I saw a lot of, yeah, nice to meet you <laughs> So, let's do, let's do another one. Raise your hand if you know what YOLO means. Oh, I see a lot of raised hands. Okay. And 
So you'll see them when they're super popular, you can go through, and these are the ones that are just like inescapable. Here are the characters, and you basically add text. And they come from really weird places. I mean, you have really long, right? The success kid is getting away with something. Um, the why you know. Most interesting man in the world is kind of hilarious to me because it's from a Dose Equis ad, and like all these people who aren't even old enough to drink are using the most interesting man in the world meme. Like, I don't always blank, but when I do, blank. Or unrelated, not all related things, but just a meme. And they don't even know where it comes from, which to me is kind of hilarious that memes can put something into the cultural canon so irremovably, yet it'll become removed from where it originally came from. So yeah, these are inescapable. If you just go to like Facebook and your friends with enough teenagers, you will at some point see a <laughs> Yeah, you do have to be, uh, they're also often the way terms. So it's memes like this that are instantly recognizable to a lot of teenagers, a lot of students. And whether we're looking at creating and sharing memes, watching YouTube videos or making them, reading celebrities, tumblers, or becoming YouTube stars, we aren't sitting back and taking a passive role, waiting for adults to tell us what to watch, read, or make. The question is, what is the lesson here for education from all this seeming tomfoolery as we strive to build a model of school that's relevant for my generation and the ones to come? Well, what if we could make learning as shared and viral as memes on Facebook or videos on YouTube? What if we could use the connections of the online world to bring schools and young people closer? One thing to realize is that while social networking sure is primarily about socializing, not education, there are many cases, often quite student-initiated, where we use Facebook as a sort of 21st century study hall. I'm part of a bunch of student-run, non-teacher-approved, non-teacher-disciplined, I don't worry, groups on Facebook, comprised of the fellow students in my classes, where we share tips and information, post resources, and yes, admittedly, sometimes in any real-world study hall, complain enthusiastically. I also, uh, I took, the snaps when I took over there, this is actually from a class I had last year, biology, and I recall that there was some, there was a tech issue with this virtual lab we were supposed to do, and someone was like, should we all try to email her? And, Classic said yes, it would increase our chances of sympathy, so there was, some, there was some scheming going on. But all in all, I found that this was a really great example, and most of my classmates had Facebook groups for a lot of their classes as well. It was a great example of how we can collaborate for a common good online and actually focus on education. So my AP Gov campaign was organized on Facebook. We were posting the new videos, and it eliminated the need for us to say, get together and spend a whole lot of time um, filming new stuff, and we could just collaborate virtually. Much as I love these groups, though, it's still a relatively shallow use of technology compared to the possibility for online projects to give students more purpose in our learning. This, to me, and many of my peers, is probably one of the most pressing and important foundations of innovation in education for the future. The ideal new school is one where all students feel purpose in their learning. When I, mean, when I say purpose, though, I don't necessarily mean I'm going to use it every day in my job, or this is a skill that I will literally have to use for a year's time. I mean, I study algebra because I want to understand the world around me better and be able to um, understand higher sciences, not because I'm realistically ever going to be using polynomials walking down the street. But we rarely give students the opportunity to directly see connections between what they're learning sitting in the classroom to, like, how will I use this? How do I build on this to move on to higher things? And when the answer to why are you doing this schoolwork is an unsatisfying because you'll need it on a test, or because you'll need it later, or because this class is a graduation requirement, then students can tune out and become disengaged. If school is supposed to be preparation for life, we're preparing students for an awfully strange life. A series of tests with multiple choice answers, or a big project worth 200 points occasionally. I mean, I wouldn't complain if the crises in my life handed me an A through E set of options that made total sense and had one right answer, but I think you and I know from your professional lives, from your personal lives, that no problem in life ever handed you a bubble sheet. So we know the problem. That very rarely do students get to put get the chance to put something they've learned into action in a way that has positive results for the community and where they can see something that I've learned is actually viable as far as um, using it later and having an impact. What we do to help the world is usually, like in my case, extracurricular. 
I don't get any credit for giving a speech or for teaching a group of students about reading and writing. So, how can we change this? Well, I recently participated in something called the National Education Startup Challenge, and it was this contest launched by the Department of Education. So I worked with my friends Maya and Priya, and we discussed a pretty interesting prompt, which was how to use technology to benefit students in urban schools who were lacking skills for college and career. So we made a video pitch. We actually were one of the winners, which was kind of cool. We got a little recognition from the Department of Ed. And our idea was this application for the future. So we said, bridge the achievement gap, build an app. <laughs> and students would work with mentors from technology fields and practice writing, reading, STEM, teamwork, et cetera, through building and marketing this app over the course of six months, and then showcasing them at a large technology conference. So here's our pitch. They said that I didn't have the technology skills I needed for the job. We were acting skills. Now there's an app for that. Application for the future. This innovative new startup provides students in underserved school districts with the unique opportunity to build 21st century skills through designing an app. Working in teams of five with expert volunteer mentors from technology fields, students will refine their products to bring to a larger audience at the Consumer Electronics Show in January. Through the collaborative process, students will develop their teamwork and leadership skills, practice writing with clarity, and obtain valuable STEM skills, all in the context of a real-world assignment. Bridge the gap, build the gap. Application for the future! <laughs> I uh, have no idea why I made that this there, by the way. There's like nothing violent about application for the future whatsoever. The entry is obviously hypothetical. But what I would love to see would be such programs actually being put in place that give students the chance to apply the skills that they've learned from their math and science classes, from their business or marketing classes, and to actually possibly make income or at least see the app in the hands of people, students, and maybe even people outside their city or state. The chance to authentically use what we learn is something that is way more motivating than an A on a test. To switch gears a little bit, I want to ask another question for the students in the room. Have you ever helped an adult or someone older than you with a piece of technology? <laughs> <laughs> Are you here? Yeah, definitely. I can attest to this experience. And for some people in the room, maybe you remember helping your parents or grandparents with technology as well. It's not necessarily just a my generation thing. But my mom has asked me, like, hey, so I'm dropping my iPhone, can you fix it? My email isn't receiving this, will you change that for me, etc. And I won't go into detail about the number of times she's asked this, because she probably get a little mad me. But I think that the point is that it's really awesome to have this reciprocal learning going on. And we learn from our parents, our grandparents, our older relatives every day, and suddenly we have this chance to return the favor and help them. It's awesome to see when adults and teachers are really open-minded about this. And I realize that this is a growing part of the new technological landscape, where the younger generation is suddenly enabled to have more knowledge or at least um, feel more comfortable with using certain interfaces and technologies than their parents or grandparents might be. So I wanted to sort of formalize this way that students can help their teachers. So I created a video series called Teach Teachers Tech. And it's over at Platform for Good, which was a collaborative project between some of the largest tech companies, including Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Yahoo. And if you um, take a look also um, at this video, Your Homework Launch a Movement, then I speak to the opportunities for clear impact and learning. Hi, I'm Doris Fetal. History teaches us that passion inspires collaboration. Just look at any successful movement for change. We can bring that same passion in the classroom by using online tools that facilitate activism. I'd love to imagine getting the assignment to start a movement. That would be pretty epic. Change.org is a great place to start. It's a site for individuals and groups to post petitions for pressing issues they believe in. Many success stories have come from students on Change.org. Three teenage girls successfully called for the first female moderator of the presidential debates in 20 years. A fourth grade class in Massachusetts led Universal Studios to launch environmental partnerships around their promotion of the Lorax. And students in Sun Valley School in California asked Crayola to start recycling its markers. 
receiving over 80,000 signatures on their petition. In all these examples, students have the chance to interact with a real audience and spark action on a real issue, a perfect example of collaborative learning. There are plenty of roles for everyone, researching the issues, writing the content, and looking into ways of raising awareness and gaining support. These are all things that help us become great learners. We have the chance to learn from our peers, think critically, and practice good digital citizenship. support and to people in the communities and professionals and communities to help support us in issues and things financially also to help our schools financially and to donate because they have more money than we do and they have and I've, I've actually reached out this year and and had guest speakers and people coming into my class that are inspiring kids to ask <coughs> really deep questions of what's going on out there what's going on with our economy <coughs> And I don't have any guest speaker funds, and I don't have funds for uh, materials in my classroom, but I'm not having any problem finding people coming in, and it's all generated by the kids. Kids are telling me well, who they want to listen to and who might be able to help us. And I think if it comes from the kids, we get that help, and that's kind of an idea. That's really terrific. Encouraging students to work, to bring in guest speakers, really motivating them, to also to help um, bring resources to the class. I think that's an amazing example. Actually, a really um, good, this is still in beta, they've had a lot of success with their early uh, integration already, but Piggybacker is teaching, is teaching you how to fundraise, and I think that they've worked with a lot of 
awesome classes, um, teams, they were featured in a few magazines. So they, not only, I mean, it's not just your typical like, fundraising website, it actually teaches students how to write persuasive letters to people and really build those skills, getting fundraising ideas and help, so that definitely speaks to that aspect. And I think you can do a lot of learning. Anyone who's done, like, you know, right? you know that knocking on doors, talking to people, really building connections, you learn a lot. And same with emailing someone who you really, really desperately want to be a guest speaker. I know that um, people who have like tried to get uh, folks that they really admire like, have <coughs> come to their school, they would really think, you know, what makes our school deserve this person and how they like think of reasons and use their best persuasive writing skills to a level that sometimes you might not see if they're writing on paper just for the teacher to read. So yeah, that's a wonderful way to get students motivated to write, to really um, practice their organizing as well. Any other ideas? I have a question for you. Yes. I was wondering in your travels and, and in your presentations, have you seen a website or schools or kids? Um, I'm trying to have my students help me write grants and come up with great grant ideas for great um, learning opportunities. And my last grant that I got, they helped me write it. Wow. And and so now I'm I'm we but that took a lot of sweat <laughs> at time. I was wondering if there's something like this in your travels or in your experience, have you heard of any websites or help for teachers and students to collaborate to write grants for schools? Because I think that's where we're going in education to support our schools, to support our classrooms. That's a great question. I have actually not heard of a website that's specifically around grants. I know that there are like more fundraising oriented ones, but I think that's an awesome idea. Like really bringing students into Kickstarter. Oh, Kickstarter is similar, not quite the same, not oriented. Kickstarter. Kickstarter, not quite oriented towards education. That's like crowdsourcing funds for projects. Uh -huh. um, but on the issue of students writing grants or helping write grants, I think that is an excellent example of real world involvement. I've actually always wanted to learn how to like write a grant and be involved in a nonprofit or school in, in that way. And I think that it also helps as far as raising respect for students because when decision makers and stakeholders in the district see, wow, students are actually really being deeply involved in this, helping on something that is driving funds and resources towards the schools, then I think that there's a lot more that's going to be student input. So Thank great you. idea, and I hope that takes off. If there isn't a website specifically toward that, I hope that you might start blogging or um, talking about that. So that's the kids have to create a website. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 <That's laughs> <I don't know. laughs> um, you talked a lot about collaboration. Could you um, share with us what kids think about uh, competition, mm -hmm. and online competition? What does that do? What kids think about competition, specifically online competition? Great question. I think that, that has a lot of different aspects. I know that um, competition can be used really well as a motivating force. It can also be somewhat detrimental to necessarily uh, learning for intrinsic value. I see that because a lot of my peers, I mean, I take three AP classes, and a lot of my peers are the pretty traditional, like really super motivated, all about school, straight A's or, you know, straight A or the highway, I'm pretty sure that's not a thing, but <laughs> if it was, that would be their, their mantra to life. You know, so I see where competition can kind of have a flip side of um, taking out some of the joy of learning, I guess. But I think that when competition is used wisely, in the example that, like, of my campaign, I'm running against people in my class, it definitely <coughs> makes me to work harder because I do not want to lose to that guy sitting next to me. <laughs> in cases where I think competition drives kids further because they're really passionate about the subject that they're competing about as opposed to, oh, I have to get 99% you know, of this or whatever. It can be used really well. One area as far as competition online where I think is really effective, and this kind of ties into the whole idea of having positive change as well. Some of you might have heard of free rice. Yeah. So this, uh, this is a really easy question example, but they have all kinds of subjects, different levels of subjects. And every question that you answer correctly will go and um, support the World Bank program through sponsors. But where competition comes into this is that you can actually create a group. And a lot of classrooms have created groups and will compete against each other. So at the same school, maybe Ms. Smith's classroom will have a free rights challenge against Mr. Willis's classroom, or even different um, in a different schedule like Ms. Smith's period three class would compete with the period four class. And so they're all, I, uh, I kind of enjoy the, the top chart because it seems to be consistently the atheists, the Christians, and the nerds against hunger are always like dueling it out with the top three. <laughs> um, 
I'm seeing like atheists are on the top right now, but I've also seen, uh, yeah, oh, Buddhists and Muslims are always pretty consistently at the top here, so yeah, that's an example of competition working awesomely to help the world. And, you know, it's way better to get out all that. We're so much better than you feeling on here than in other ways, I think, since it goes to help um, people who are truly in need. So, yeah, great example of competition and how it can be a motivating force. And the other ideas of projects with real world impact connecting with curricular topics. All right, so let's move on. Um, in the Teach Teachers Tech video, you saw what I see as the new project based learning. Traditional project-based learning still doesn't really break free of the balance of the classroom walls. I see this firsthand because um, my sister, for instance, she hosted a project in her ninth grade honors world history class where she had to make a map of India, or a 3D map of India, I should say. And so she spent about two and a half hours uh, using this, like, rolling out a giant sheet of clay, and cutting it painstakingly to be in the shape of India, and then she painted it, and then she cried because the paint made it not look Indian or something. I don't know how that works. <laughs> and took these little blue beads and stuck them in to become the Indian server. And I looked at that, and I thought, OK, this is kind of a waste of time. But my belief that it was a waste of time was really solidified. When we went to India, and she had no idea where anything <laughs> I mean, if you make a 3D map of India, one would at least hope that the geography sticks. Nothing but the play really did. So, <laughs> this is an example of where a project that was worth a lot of points, it might look pretty, it might make for a nice thing to stick in the corner of a class or put up on a wall, but it doesn't stick in here, and that's what really matters. And it doesn't have an impact anywhere else but inside that class. So outside of class, I think that students can get really invested in issues that we care about. The PBS or the, the documentary Half the Sky, which was aired on PBS recently, um, I watched it and it was all about the moral imperative to solve the problems of the disenfranchisement of women and girls around the world. And it had some extremely poignant stories, some, and it really profiled the problem unblinkingly. And so I was talking about it with some of my friends at lunch, and I was honestly, I think I. I had low expectations to some extent of my peers because I was surprised talking with these other girls to, at the extent to which everyone was really riled up and wanted to do something. The fact that we even spent our entire um, lunch time talking about this issue and what we could do. So you might think, or you might have this image in your head of apathetic teenagers who don't really get into issues, who don't really care too much about the election or what's going on in the world or current events, but when we find an issue that makes us angry or that makes us sad or that we really take pride in or want to get involved in, we will do as much as we can to that end. And if we can channel that same motivation, that same drive, that same enthusiasm and passion into something that we're doing in your class or in, your, in classrooms across your school or school district, imagine the amount that we can learn. So if you were to find out more about different projects that could be possible or different ways to get students involved, you could take a look at, I wrote these articles for Mashable, one is about five groundbreaking competitions for innovative youth. So you have things like the Google Science Fair, the Imagine Cup from Microsoft, the Intel Science and Engineering Fair, the Siemens Math, Science and Technology Competition, the DuPont Challenge Science Essay Competition. You'll see it's pretty STEM focused. Unfortunately, in this article, also since it was on Mashable Technology Blog, most of that stuff is technology related. And then I also wrote another article on Mashable about social good, profiling websites like freerice.com that enable students to have so uh, make an impact in social good. Imagine if you challenge your students to participate in something like this in science class. They would probably learn a whole lot over the course of participating in a contest or competition like this one, an amount that they might not learn sitting and listening to a couple lectures, which is a bit provocative to say, but I think that it's true. Not to mention that this is incredibly motivating. So the new project-based learning, I think, allows students to really have a footprint to have an impact and to see the change that is enacted because of the actions they take. There are some excellent examples of how the internet can empower us to do good and really do more than say, hey, what's up, LOL and OMG. <laughs> so I use the internet really heavily, social networking, I should say, to be more precise, and organizing TEDx Redmond 
which is a conference. How many of you have heard of TED? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, almost everyone. That's awesome. Generally, when I speak to education <coughs> conferences or um, crowds who are administrators and educators, the number of hands raised isn't quite that large. So TEDx, so I mean, is an independently organized TED event. There are thousands of these that happen around the world, the TEDx's. And so ours is a little bit unique in the sense that we have an all youth board of organizers. We have every speaker, 19 or under, and the majority of our audience is young people. So this was the third year that we organized it. We had 20 people on our committee, and 1,000 people showed up. Wow. It was a little bit crazy. We, were, we made continual jokes about how some of our volunteers had to be enlisted to be bouncers. <laughs> that was how much everyone wanted to get in. And we used everything from Facebook to Gmail, Google Docs, Google Plus, Skype, Wikis, YouTube. I think that we used, um, we tried to do a Google Hangout one, at one point. Um, for some reason, it, it malfunctioned a little bit, but we persisted. I think that's another thing, the adaptability and the persistence of when things don't work that really marked our group's use of technology as successful. It's crucial to how we found sponsorship, organized and marketed the event, and distributed our talks. The TEDx Redmond event and all the speakers at TEDx Redmond really helped show that technology plus young people doesn't have to equal a name abbreviations and distracting chatter. It can equal good for the world. The same is true of education plus technology plus young people. Another way to give students purpose and allow us to help the world is to let us teach. And I spoke to this point a bit earlier when I mentioned seven-year-old me and how inspired I was to become teaching and where we need to get the next teachers from. I know for sure that teaching has made me a better learner. Probably a lot of you know this firsthand, but when you began teaching, maybe you were tutoring somebody else, or maybe you were trying to explain a difficult math problem, and suddenly you realized, wow, now I understand this inside and out, or in more depth than I ever could have imagined before. And the same is true for me in writing, because when I started giving these presentations, working collaboratively with students to build stories, I realized where my own weaknesses were, and I tried to address those vulnerabilities. Currently, I've taught quite a few schools, and I've learned over the process um, that the teacher shouldn't necessarily be this person in the most suit of invincible armor of knowledge that is so much superior to everyone else. One of the things that I felt made me able to connect with students really well as a teacher was the fact that I told them, I'm still learning just like you. So when teachers can do that, and when teachers can do that effectively, I find that incredibly empowering. One way a lot of teachers are doing that is by giving students the chance to teach them whether about how to use technology effectively in the classroom or other things. I see this as one of the best things about the ease of content creation today. The fact that young people like me can get up on YouTube and deliver these presentations and have them watched by hundreds or even thousands or tens of thousands of people around the world. This would not have been possible if I were born a couple decades earlier. Of course, sometimes my peers will go online and upload <laughs> things that aren't quite so helpful. How many of you have seen Friday, if I remember that? Oh, that's great. <laughs> okay, so, don't worry, I'm not going to show it. I'm going to show it, but for those who have not seen it, look it up. You'll really enjoy it. <laughs> um, there are also examples where students upload things that you might say are harmful or distracting at the very least. But I think that the approach that we have to take to technology is a smart one where students are encouraged to upload the right kind of content and given the chances to do so. So the trend of students teaching is really catching on at mathtrain.tv. You can find students making videos about all kinds of topics in mathematics. I use that website myself to get math help. And it's really encouraging to know that your peers are actually helping you along. At TED, they've started a new initiative called TED Ed. So they have lessons worth sharing. It's in beta right now. They have these amazingly beautifully animated videos about all kinds of crazy topics, dark matter to um, finding habitable worlds, and they're really neatly animated, kid-friendly, all ages, and they use the craziest <coughs> techniques to teach about some things that you might see, say are really boring, like the Electoral College Explain, and many others. So, all kinds of topics. A glimpse of teenage life in each room. I need to watch that one. <laughs> but what makes TED Ed really cool is the fact that it doesn't encourage just passively watching some really cool videos. You can actually go and do something called clipping a lesson. So if I go and I find, I'm going to click on what I would feel is a really, I mean, a topic I wouldn't generally look for videos under, which is business and economics. So I'm going to try to challenge myself here. And I'll put rethinking thinking. So that sounds interesting. So I can play the video, but what I can do now is I can flip this lesson. So I'm going to log in. 
And what Flipping lets me do is customize and share it. So if you're a teacher and you have a class that you want to share a video with, you can title it. So you could say, uh, it economics. And then you can edit the description, you can write questions, you can remove or exclude a question, you can change the dig deeper question, you could um, even add in some closing thoughts, you would hit finish flip and then you can send it to all of your students. So if you want to make it private or else, you can do so. When you finish the flip and you send it to your students, you can see who's clicked on it, how they've answered the questions, whether they watched the whole video, you get a whole lot of data which I think is super powerful. What's more, however, you don't, you, um, not only can you flip the videos that are already on TED-Ed, but you can actually create your own lesson by simply filming something, uploading it to YouTube, and then flipping it on ed.ted.com. So one thing that the people at TED-Ed said they didn't even expect, though, was when a little girl in England who was nine years old just went on YouTube, made a video about how to sew. She got out her sewing machine, and she flipped it on TED Ed. And that really started something where students would begin teaching on TED Ed and on YouTube and other places. So to show an example of what this could look like. Hi, my name is Sarah Manor, and today we are going to talk about germs. Hand germs? Sneeze germs? Achoo! Teamwork germs. Germs are not for sharing. <laughs> Did you know that one bacteria weighing one trillionth of a gram can kill a blue whale weighing over 100 million grams? Such is the power of germs. <laughs> now let's examine the science behind germs. Before we discovered this word species or germs, under his microscope in the 1600s, we assumed disease was caused by either evil spirit or naughty parents. <laughs> <laughs> At the right age of 18, his people assumed it was because of the sins of his father. In other cultures, where diseases were believed to be caused by evil spirits, kids would dance around the sick person and saw their animal poo on his body. <laughs> Four kinds of germs. Bacteria, which cause sore throats, ear infections, and cavities. Viruses, which cause chicken pox, measles, and the flu. Fungi, which causes athlete's foot, and protozoa, which causes the runs. Nutrients from your environments to live. But not all bacteria are bad. Some bacteria, like the kind you can find in yogurt, help break down the food and absorb nutrients, which makes you live longer. In fact, while there are a lot of yogurt, are not for everyone so, how do we protect ourselves from these wretched beasts? Wash your hands. Well, that's all for today. This is Cameron with Can Science News. <laughs> so, you can see what will happen when students really take initiative and think, hmm, I want to teach science, I'm passionate about a topic, how do I make this engaging and entertaining? And I think that I learned a lot as well about exactly that, how to be engaging and entertaining, because it never would have occurred to me to teach about bacteria and germs by using stuffed animals and, you know, acting out shamans did. That part is still my favorite. Um, there are a lot of awesome moments and laugh lines in here, but I think that the really important thing to realize is that not only are we benefiting as the audience and whoever's learning from the video, but also think about how much she probably learned through the process of how am I editing this to make it really interesting for a viewer? How do I write this script so that it's um, interesting and funny, how do I make sure the information is relevant and accurate, and all of this stuff. So, in the process of teaching again, making someone a better learner. On the more right. Hi again! In this clip, I'm going to tell you how I wrote my books. It all started with National Local Writing, a program on the internet which challenges you to write a book in 30 days. They have lots of worksheets and tips to help you as you work. You have to set a goal for how many words you want to write which we call a word count goal. For my first book, I set my word count goal at 2,000 words. That may sound like a lot, but really it's only five or six sentences a day. <laughs> to get started, I wrote an outline and created characters. To make an outline, I wrote some short notes to remind me where my story was going. For example, my outline for chapter one, Birds on the Run, said something like this. Eva needs a hummingbird. We meet the bullies, and Eva protects the hummingbird from the bullies. When you're writing a book, you have to think about three
three things. Setting, characters, and plot. It's easy. Setting means the time and the place the story happens. Birds on the run set in modern times. It takes place in both North Dakota and South Carolina. <laughs> characters are people, animals, monsters, or whoever is in the story. Birds on the Run features Eva, the hummingbird, the bullies, Eva's mom, Eva's grandmother and cousins, a school principal, and an airplane story. <laughs> In the next video, I'll tell you more about plot, and we'll take a roller coaster ride together. She is horrible. So, I looked at that and I was like, wow, I mean, she's not only did she get started doing videos and teaching earlier than I did, which I feel gives me a lot of hope as far as what the next generation is doing, how early they're starting to teach and really become interested in helping others and spreading a message about writing. But also, I saw this is something that everyone can do because the tools that they use, it's nothing special. It's maybe like screen capture technology, a webcam, and YouTube. And that's something that most people can find access to, whether at school or perhaps by asking parents or friends. So the ease of content creation really does need to be looked at as a problem that opens up possibilities for distraction. It can be looked at as an amazing solution and a way to encourage students to become the next teachers. So we can do this in online and share that out to our schools, to our friends, and to younger students around the world. We can also provide tech support for our teachers. I talked about Teach Teachers Tech, that project, which outlines a lot of different useful tools for educators. And there are um, nonprofits like Generation Yes and Mouse Club that really um, propose the idea of formalizing students as tech support in a way in their classrooms. So, the important thing to remember is that technology, while well, sure, it allows us to see things better, to have the opportunity to you know, watch videos on larger screens, to interact with a whiteboard, or whatever um, it may be, that the real power of the internet, of the new tools that we have at our fingertips, is the two-way communication. The ease not only to be able to consume, but to create. And giving students the opportunity to take advantage of both of those things I think is imperative as we move forward. Because what I've been seeing a lot of right now is we have these netbooks in our classes and we're watching videos. Or it'll be go to this website and take some notes. But what about creating that website? What about putting out those videos ourselves? And those are things I think that we can learn even more from. Now, in the course of 21st century education reform, many brand new organizations have been created. Uh, I saw Parent Revolution Outdoor, Students for Education Reform, many of these other organizations. We've heard from administrators, teachers, consultants, politicians, parents. But one key voice I've seen missing over and over again is that of the student. And when I go to some large education conferences that have superintendents of districts and other stakeholders, and, or they'll often use that term, stakeholders, actually, and I'll hear that and I'll think, okay, you're talking about stakeholders, but who is the biggest stakeholder in education? Whose future is most determined by education? Whose daily life is most affected by education? And the stakeholder who is often ignored or not mentioned or represented too often is the student. So keeping us silent is a fundamental flaw in any education reform program or plan. And I've taken steps to really try to share my voice on a more local level. I wrote a letter to my local school district asking what structures the district had in place to solicit student voice. It was a pretty long letter, it was like, I don't know, seven, eight paragraphs. And to my disappointment, I received a polite acknowledgement reply back that, you know, listed a couple of boards that if they wanted students could come testify at. But there were, were no really definable steps for further action invitations for students to come and speak, or any questions asked about what is it like to be a student in our district? How do you feel your school is serving? So for those of you who are in roles where you make decisions frequently about your schools and school districts, so probably most of you, ask yourself, is there a student involved here? What would a student's input on this look like? Am I asking a student? And if you find at any point that the answer to that is no, then you can go ahead and fix it with something as simple as asking for a group of students to be called in. Another point is that, again, people will say, well, you're exceptional, of course, we'll listen to students like you, but what about students who are going to give us answers like, no more homework, take away grades, and we want school to be out every day? Well, the thing is, 
is that there are no better or worse students when it comes to listening to us. There are no superior or inferior students, students whose voices should be heard and students whose voices shouldn't be heard. The voice of a student who is in a special education or an ESL class or who gets F's or is about to drop out is every bit as valuable as mine or any of my classmates in an AP class who are surely on the track for an Ivy League school. And I think that the idea that we should listen to some student voices but not others is at its core extremely undemocratic and reflects badly on school leadership. So it's a call for student voices, but not just a few student voices, all student voices. Because only then, when we model this listening to students, can we provide an example of what students should aspire to, to be great listeners as well as speakers, to be great learners as well as teachers. So in the wake of getting this polite reply from my school district, I definitely didn't give up. I figured out how can I organize larger action. There must be other students, not only in my school and in other schools, but also really teachers and educators who want to band together and help us as we try to get student voice to be incorporated more. So I started a group called uh, the Student Union. And I definitely highly encourage you all to join it, please, and check out some of the discussions we've had. We've been posting a lot of resources. People will post things about conferences that they've spoken at, um, videos, speeches, different books, all kinds of things. And what I really wanted to do was to make a place for students to voice their concerns, their insights, their action plans for what could be changed. So here was one of the very first discussions that we had, which was asking everyone to introduce themselves. And people wrote some really detailed responses. Um, my friend Irene asked, what is a teacher? And Hannah said, this is how I like to think of it. A teacher is somebody who is walking on a path seeking understanding. A student comes along and, they ask, and asks which way to go. The teacher points down the path and they walk together. A lot of people assume the teacher is already at the end of the road, but I like to think that the road doesn't end. Which is a really poetic expression of what a teacher is. It inspired me a lot to read that. The heel said, they doubted, you believed, I succeeded, which is extremely catchy. And the heel actually is a great example of a success story of student voice in the sense that extremely discontented with the school and with the system and um, having a lot of energy to channel all these thoughts about education reform, he authored a book, which has just come out actually, One Size Does Not Fit All, and it contains his voice on education. I had the chance to read some early chapters, and it is inflammatory and passionate and definitely worth reading. Um, it'll be really poor, I think, but I think that it is so awesome that a student has stood up and published a book specifically on education as he has. So within the student union, we had all these discussions. A lot of people were really active, saying that they wanted history to really come alive instead of a series of facts that needs to be memorized. Ethan talked about getting rid of our lecture style in the science class and having everything we learned through experiments and incredible projects, which I thought was really worth thinking about. So yeah, the, stu um, the student union that features all of these kinds of questions, answers, resources being posted. I felt like that was a great channel for me to be able to work towards some of my goals in that area. So despite this great possibility for connecting with us, and despite the fact that more often than not we might use the internet to do our homework, and it's how we're connecting with our families and organizations online, when we walk into school, it all turns off. Many schools take a highly restrictive approach to internet use. Let's do a quick survey. There are some different tiers of filtering. Like, there could be no filtering at all. You walk into school and you can get online and pretty much go anywhere you want. Level two would be some filtering, but with educational sites allowed. And level three would be a filter that works on guilty until proven innocent. That is, the only websites you can access are ones that the school district put on an approved list. So, raise your hand if your school has some internet filtering. Being mostly raised hands. Yeah, it would be really unusual for a school to have like, no internet filtering whatsoever. Uh, I'm pretty sure, like, pretty much um, almost impossible. And so, yeah, my school definitely has internet filtering. For some reason, Netflix is still unblocked on school Netflix. That was not a evil glint of my eye leaving. <laughs> Nor do I say I can do anything nefarious with that knowledge. But they did block Tumblr, Facebook, Gmail, YouTube, pretty much everything else that is social or that uh, requires any headline. So, Anyone have extremely restrictive filtering so the guilty until proven innocent kind? Mm -hmm. Wow. Definitely. So that's, I have to know as much as I talk to students who go to school with that. 
Now to me, and this is just my opinion, I don't have, I haven't done a whole lot of research about this, um, and I would like to in the future, I think it's an important issue, but I think that restrictive filtering is a slightly short-term approach. I prefer what I like to call the touch the stove approach, which kind of sounds dangerous, but the name comes from memory from when I was very young, and I was absolutely incorrigible. I just would always go over to the stove and try to touch it, even though my mom would be like, it's hot, you'll burn yourself. So finally she got frustrated enough to turn the heat down really, really low and say, go ahead. So I was like, and refused to touch the stove again, clearly, because I realized, oh, it's pretty hot, and I didn't burn myself because it was too low, but um, I learned from that experience, and I didn't clamor to touch the stove again for another long while until I started cooking. That's another story. <laughs> my parents and I have again refused to touch the stove since my cooking was terrible. But my sister were fine. Or my, or my parents were fine. My sister and me being on the internet from a very young age, and even with us making these ridiculous videos where we would dance around and lip sync to the Numa Numa song. Has anyone heard that? Okay, it was really popular years back. And I'm really glad we were allowed to do that at that age because otherwise we would not have known the shame of uploading horrible lip syncing videos to YouTube and we would do worse stuff in front of a camera during spring break in college. So I think that having had this experience of having to change privacy settings on literally hundreds of videos to private. Um, there's, we'll be a little more wary next time of what we upload. And in fact, sometimes I have more discretion on what we post on Facebook and stuff than my mom does. My mom will take a picture of me falling asleep at a restaurant and think that that is funny while I am like, Mom, why would you do that? So <laughs> it is a perfect example of how touching the stove worked to educate me about what should be kept private online, what should not be uploaded online, and my sister as well. Another analogy that you might use, never teach a child to walk across the street when they're little, and they won't know how to do it safely when they reach adulthood. We go to school and we power off the cell phones and laptops and avoid blocked websites like personal blogs, Gmail, YouTube, Facebook, but you know that when we go home, we'll power on our own computers and go straight to those websites anyway. So, in contrast, in some other schools, educators really embrace the possibilities of social networking. Some teachers even set up their own Twitter accounts or Facebook pages to stay in touch with students. During a campaign for AP Gov, we got to post our opening statements on YouTube, and I was sitting, because of all my experience with filtering and how restrictive schools can be sometimes, I was waiting for that. Oh, and if you have any privacy concerns with YouTube, and here's this disclaimer, you must sign so that your parents do not sue us. But there was none of that. It was just taken as this realistic expectation that we were all you know, won't upload it to YouTube. And to me, that represented a real step forward in education. A great example of positive internet use comes from the example of Esther Wojcicki, and she's a longtime teacher of journalism at Palo Alto High School in California. And in her class, she teaches students skills of journalism, including how to evaluate sources for truth, clarity, and bias, and looking at sources both online and off critically. She's not trying to avoid the problem of the garage of sometimes unreliable information on the internet. She's confronting it head on. And her students are thriving. Their school has five publications, including some magazines, and they have an entirely student-run and edited full-print newspaper, The Campanile, which can be found online. And it includes some amazing insights and articles about the students' educational experiences, so it has some great published examples of student voice and just about everything else. Now, to me though, the idea that you should evaluate sources critically, that shouldn't just be a skill that you learn in journalism class. That's a 21st century skill that students should be taught in school as <coughs> digital citizens. In my own experience, having a blog from a young age was, again, key to showing me what do you share? How do you ensure that your audience enjoys what you're reading? How do you write with clarity and make sure that your sources are accurate? So if schools are worried about student privacy, of course, there's always the possibility that they have blogs private and filtering comments. But I think that students shouldn't be overly protected from the big, bad world of the internet. I wrote this post for Gulf News in Dubai, actually, as a columnist. And I find that students, especially in the modern world, are often a whole uh, lot less innocent than parents might like and teachers might like to think. And so it can be a little bit reductive to say, oh, we'll just filter everything, as opposed to teaching us how to evaluate sources critically and know how to navigate the internet. So the internet, 
um, to me. Of course, it's a place where there are, you know, you don't want to go to some places, but it was really crucial to my learning in early childhood, so I have a more positive view of how it can be used in education. My mom set up email accounts for my sister and me, when many other kids were just learning how to write longhand, and I got to write letters to my grandmother, and that taught me a whole lot about writing and becoming a better correspondent. In some families, and in most schools I know, there isn't this early access and openness around internet use. So we have these tools at our disposal. They're waiting and ready to go. The innovative school is no longer going to be a monolithic experience. It's going to be a patchwork of many different opportunities, formats, people, relationships, online and off. But I want to ask you a question. Which of these images looks most like your typical average school view? <laughs> a, B, or C. So raise your hand for A. Raise your hand for B. Raise your hand for C. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Seeing most of your hands, okay. So, yeah, A is an image of me from Saint Chapelle in Paris, and B is an image of, I believe, the library at the British Museum, and C is a picture of a hallway of the prison at Robben Island, <laughs> <laughs> where Nelson Mandela was in prison for 20 years. But when the schools we go to every day look more like prisons than they do cathedrals or libraries, we have a problem. It's not just a prison imprisons people. The traditional school model that we're also used to, that 19th century model that students are stuck in, it imprisons learning by treating learning like it's something we can only do seven hours a day, five days a week, by listening to one source of information in one place. That just doesn't make sense anymore. Now we have so many sources of learning, and the ability to liberate it from being confined within four walls and a whiteboard. I understand the architectural limitations and the reasoning behind the current model that would make it look like that, but I think that we can work to change the ethos of schools that treat learning as something to be restricted to a building. Creating lifelong learners starts with the understanding that our world is the best classroom of all. Teachers can come from all places and be of all ages. They can be young people like Eva Ridenhauer and Cameron Manor, the girls that you saw teaching in those videos who have a camera and internet access. They can be people like Sal Ham, whose Cam Academy you've probably heard of, and has over 3,100 teaching videos. So when I think of a vision for an ideal school, one that liberates learning instead of imprisons it, I ask questions. What if instead of prisons, schools are more like libraries in the sense of acting as portals to knowledge and discovery, and more like cathedrals, not in the religious sense, but in inspiring students to learn with purpose and to look upward? Realizing the power and potential of harnessing youth digital culture about students for educational purposes, seeking students' voices directly on educational issues, and ensuring that everything we learn allows us to have an impact in the world. These are the actions we need to take to journey on the road ahead for the student of today. To go back to the story of my AP Go campaign, fingers crossed that I made a good impression on my potential constituents, I want to tell you something larger about the impact of the campaign in the class on me. So I told you that I um, was following the Bush Gore campaigns in 2000, but I wasn't even really joking. <laughs> back when I was three years old, I know it's kind of ridiculous, but I would listen to those sound bites. I'll say that much, but then later when my mom would take my sister and me and go on a walk to the local park, I would climb up onto this big boulder that was there and basically use it as my stage and give these long, rambling, impromptu speeches on why everyone should vote for me. <laughs> I'm told it was really cute, but I think it might have been creepy if I was walking past it. I went to my first political rally when I was 10 years old back in 2008. Yet, despite all this, I would often dismiss the idea of running for office, kind of vacillating between the ideas of doing it and not, much like a real politician, actually. And in the process of learning in this class and running in this fictional campaign, I realized, or like miniature campaign, I should say, they are voting, I realized a lot of how addicting politics, even on such a tiny scale as this, is. As I declared to my parents in a moment of excitement, I wish this were my life. And I was pretty serious. Of course, the Speed Talk 2012 campaign may only be my life for a week, but the integration of technology to develop a game plan, the passion and dedication of a group of high school students, whom you might think at this age would be apathetic about politics, and a 15-year-old girl's newfound or rediscovered interest in political office, all of this reflects what can happen 
an educator creates a learning environment conducive to self-directed, self-motivated, and self-inspired learning. Thank you.
received an uh, assignment to a bunch of students who maybe come into the class with drastically different performance levels than the teacher in the classroom next door, of course you're going to look worse on an evaluation. So I think of that as extremely unfair, just from a basic point of view. Um, as a student, however, I would like to be able to have a place to say, here's what I think of this teacher and how they can improve. <coughs> I don't think it would necessarily have to be an evaluation that is tied to pay or that is tied to whether the teacher keeps their job, but there just needs to be an effective way for teachers to be able to receive consistent feedback from students for that integration of student voice to happen, and I think evaluation would be a part of that. Yes? It sounds like your parents showed a lot of courage in allowing you to become, you and your sister to become independent learners at such a young age. How would you recommend that we help other parents um, have that courage? How do we as, as teachers instill that courage in parents to allow their children to determine their own learning arc? Great question. I think that um, to kind of go to why a lot of parents are maybe a little afraid to do that, I have a lot of friends whose parents are extremely traditional in the sense that well, I mean, they have very high expectations. They want their sons or daughters to be in the most advanced class possible, get the highest grades possible, and they don't really accept alternatives or much self-direction in how they're learning. And I think that a big part of that is they feel in order to be successful, you have to follow one path. So one of the best things to do is to show examples of how success can follow all kinds of different directions. I think that's been helped a little bit by some very high profile examples of people who have really started their own paths. But too often, I mean, we see someone like, for instance, Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates. They do it in college, and I think that, or you know, after dropping out of college, and I think that a lot of parents assume that high school is too young for students to make decisions. So show me examples of young people who have already started making decisions. And Nikhil is a great example who he was writing a book. He's had more absences from school that he's like on the cusp of, hey, you have too many absences, you won't graduate on time. Yet he's still pushing forward to work for change he, can, he believes in. Another great example of a young person who's doing self-directed learning is Lean uh, Dalil. She's in Dubai, and her sister, um, and she had been just schooling themselves, basically using online courses and building their own curriculum since they were quite young. So. Having more examples of young people like this, to share with parents, to share with students, to hold up as models, I think can be an effective way to dispel the idea that we are not capable or responsible enough to do it at this age. Thank you. Yes? Um, what are your thoughts on the lack of, um, I guess, digital equity for students in inner city schools and youth who still, in 2011, don't have um, internet access and the risk, and how do you think we bridge that gap? I feel like the disparities in internet equity, that's like one of the hugest problems that I see in education today. Actually, it's interesting you mentioned that because I just done a little bit of research on that in one of my um, advertisements to the campaign because I was trying to really run as an education candidate. So that is something that I feel like I, as a student in a school district by Microsoft, really affluent, I didn't see it firsthand at all, but then I heard from enough teachers who were saying, you know, like the computers in my classrooms are barely working, and the students go home and they don't really have broadband internet and stuff like that. Um, I think that one-to-one -one computing, if there is the budget within a district, can be a great way to address that. But even devices, I know that um, some schools are applying for technology grants from the Department of Education that can be, um, I'm, that I believe are easier access if the schools like Title One or has special financial need, um, and they're using that to say bring like one device to more students. Just any way to get technology in the classrooms for students to create content as well. Um, I think that internet equity is not only a pressing issue for its educational value, but also just for it's a moral imperative that students in an inner city school district have the same access to the technologies that students in that suburb do. So yeah, I would say that. Making solutions available um, using grants, um, sometimes from the federal government, state departments, um, technology, uh, maybe working with nonprofits as well could be a possible solution. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you.
speakers. Uh, and I'll have to say that personally, I think this is probably the most thoughtful presentation mm -hmm. yes. that we have met. to explain how she, she really is a model for the 21st century learner, the voice in education. So, Adora, thank you so thank very you so much. much. Thank you. Now I'm going to tell you things about food and all that stuff. Before I do that, I have a test for you. So, it's after this program, and Adora will SYB. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.